So that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, Sean, how self-published writers can build a sustainable, future-proof career. So the title, Write, Publish, Repeat, sort of sums up your whole philosophy on indie publishing success. <laughs> and <laughs> I think it's perfect for you because I read somewhere that you wrote, what was it, nearly two million words last year? Something um, crazy <laughs> like that. Yeah, I definitely didn't write all those myself. Um, okay. I, have, I have two like amazing writing partners, um, David Wright at Collective Inkwell and Johnny Truant at, um, at Realm and Sands. And um, those are just kind of like our two little imprints. And um, so the words were divided amongst the two of them. And um, the three of us wrote a lot of words. Yeah, yeah. It, was, <laughs> it was really, really tremendous. And, and writing a lot and, and often or like daily is a major part of your advice on creating that sustainable indie uh, oh, career. yeah. It's like if you're I, I just I I've always treated my writing like a business because it's that's how I feed my family, you know, and um, the, the smarter I work, the better we eat. Like it really is that simple. And, um, you know, I, I, I flailed around on long for, online for a really long time before I finally got it, you know, and, and when I got it, I was like, OK, well, I need to ghostwrite because ghostwriters get paid well because they're willing to like not get the credit. So while a lot of freelancers go out for like jobs where they get the byline, like I didn't care about a byline because I don't like really care about auto insurance. Like I don't, I don't need credit for that. Like you, you go ahead and say you said it. Like it'll just be between us. Like that's okay. And I, I, you know, and and I got some really romantic jobs. I wrote wedding vows for people. Like I like that. Like that's fun. Mm -hmm. So like I really did it all. I, 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 I kind of touched a lot of stuff, including writing books. And, um, and, and the best stuff, what the best paying gigs were always like marketing copy. So I got really good at writing marketing copy, but I never cared about credit for any of it. So I learned to write well and I learned to write fast. And when it was time to write fiction, like I knew how to write, I knew how to get words down and, um, and, and make them good. <laughs> so, um, it's just been, a, I'm really lucky that we live in the time and place that we do where a guy like me can, can do that. You know, mm -hmm. you tell stories, you build an audience, and you tell more stories. That's really awesome. I couldn't have done this 10 years ago. And I'm, uh, you know, um, it, yes, I've leveraged the time, but I'm so grateful that the time was available to me. So what is your advice to other writers who want to write as much as you do? Is it simply a matter of just practicing and, and, and just getting used to getting the words down on paper every day? Yeah, I think that um, one of the reasons I'm able to do it is because I'm always in flow. Now, flow is the hardest thing to get as a writer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's runner's high, you know, and you don't get runner's high until you run a really long time. And then it's like you're about to die. You know, you've got just a, a volcano in your lungs and you're going to melt into nothing. And then it's okay. And writing's like that. And the thing is, like, I write every day. And so it's, it's pretty easy for me to s show up. I show up and I write my words and, and that's, that's a really great place to be, but I have to earn it. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm actually going through a really hard time because it's a new year and I haven't written like that the last of the year I had, I had to catch up on just like a, a ton of stuff. I had to get a, Johnny and I basically had to wrap, write, publish, repeat and close all these funnels that we had talked about in the book, but that like weren't quite perfectly in place for the holiday. So the last month was just really grueling and I had to stop writing. And I'd been writing every single day for five months straight, Saturday, Sunday, every day. And so when I do that, it, I get 3,000 words out just like that. It's easy. Like I sit down and like, because that's, that's what I try to get each day is 3,000 mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. And if, I, um, if, I, if I'm on, like that's, that's a couple hours work. It's just not a big deal. Mm -hmm. If I'm off, and, and, and I had been on for, you know, it takes about, six weeks to really like, mm, like this just feels good and I can write without stopping and I'm done. Um, but it, it takes six weeks. <laughs> so, so it's, it's like building a muscle essentially. It's, 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 it's exactly like so that. You're building the muscle, you're creating the momentum and you're, you, you're kind of getting into that rhythm. Um, and you're aiming for 3000 words. You have that goal in mind every day. And then how does it actually look? Do you shut the door and tell your kids to, you know, 
F off for the day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Is really it? important, actually. That's a great question because you have to um, – not everybody can get 3,000 words out. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, f- for, for some that's not only like many hours, but it's like they're, they're sustained hours. They're quiet hours. They're, they're good hours. So the most important thing is not your volume. Like three thousand words is is my um, is my volume because it's a it's my full time living, mm-hmm. um, and b I'm really aggressive. So like I I want to build these piles of words. I love it. Like it's mm-hmm. my favorite thing. So like like it's not even when it's when I'm in flow, it's not even work. It's just fun, um, and I like all the projects that I'm involved with. So like. It's awesome, but um, maybe you can only get 500 words a day. That's awesome. Get those 500 words a day. Um, you know, an hour. If you can get an hour, and even if you can, if you can only get, you know, 20 minutes and get a couple hundred words, be thinking about the story. So when you sit down, those 200 words come out. You know, George R. R. Martin only writes a couple hundred words a day, you know, and the dude wrote Game of Thrones. So, um, you know, it really is about being consistent. Mm-hmm. That's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And how do you approach um, your edits? Because we all know that so much of writing is rewriting. Um, if you have that goal in mind to do 3,000 words a day, how does your rewriting fit into that plan? Um, okay, it depends on um, on who I'm working with. The 3,000 words is just like that. Those are my words that go in a pile. Um, you know, they might even be blog posts. They might be they might be stuff that you know never sees the light of day. But it's 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 writing. Um, then I do a substantial amount of editing because that's primarily what I do with uh, with Johnny and with Dave. Now, with the stuff I do with Dave at the Inkwell, I I write half of that and he writes half of that. I edit everything. I polish everything. Um, and Dave makes up a lot of the story with me, or most of the story in most cases. So we make up the story, we write the story, I edit and polish the story, and then Dave gets it to market. With Johnny, um, I make up the story, he writes the story, um, I edit and polish the story. So I'm editing on both ends. So I have editing every single day. Um, Editing my stuff is way harder than editing copy from Dave or Johnny, because I write you know, fast. Sometimes it's great, but sometimes it's like, dude, <laughs> slow down. <laughs> and I actually spend more time editing than um, writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, uh, editing my stuff is harder, but um, but it's also you know equally rewarding because I really like I like shaping things. I actually like the editing process. I don't find it tedious. Mm-hmm. I only find it tedious when I have a lot to do. Mm-hmm. But taking something that's already good and making it great, I, I is just I love that part of the process. Okay, great. So, writing um, all these words and and finishing all these stories and finishing all these books is the first kind of piece of major piece of advice that you give people in the book. And so, let's say that I take your advice on board and I get into a momentum and I build that muscle and I start to become this writing machine and I finish, you know, my five, ten books, whatever it is, in a year. Um, And that's great. But then the question on everyone's lips is, how do I find people to read those stories and read those books? Um, which, of course, is the big question mark. Um, marketing your book. And what I really liked about your approach in the book is this psychology-driven marketing plan that you talk about. Um, and you start from the place which I think so many authors neglect, which is the ideal reader. <laughs> Oh yeah, and That's figuring out who they're writing for, and this is something that um, I see time and time again when I ask people who their book is for, and they give me this smile and they say, "Well, I think anybody could enjoy it." And, and, and that, to me, is the first Yeah, that's sign. really wrong. <laughs> it's really wrong. And it's almost like they take pride in thinking that anybody could enjoy it, but that, to me, is just like a red flag straight up. You know, not everybody should be enjoying it. You should take pride in the fact that some people are going to love it and some people are not going to like it at all. I think that's, that shows, um, well, first of all, really strong writing, but also like that's how you need to target your marketing message to those people that are really, really going to fall in love with it. Um, so to, for you how, do you, how do you approach this? Do you do your ideal reader kind of exercise or mental exercise or whatever it is before you've written the book or do you do that afterwards? Um, again, it depends on the project. Okay. Um, 
the 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 thing about kind of coming up as a ghostwriter, mm-hmm. man, I had to adapt very quickly, and that wasn't because. Um, I wanted to necessarily. It was just like a matter of survival. Like, okay, you're going to write a, a sales letter today because that's what your your client wants, and um, tomorrow you will be writing wedding vows. <laughs> These are very different types of things, right? And then like the next week would be a memoir, and it would just like that's that was uh, my, that's what my ghostwriting shop did. Like I did anything because I just wanted like to pay my bills, and it was a very very hard time. And I, th- I'm so grateful for that time. Like it was awful. It was hard, but I'm so grateful for it now because the skill set that it it helped me build is is I'm just lucky to have. And um, uh, I I'm, I think I lost your question. Um, <laughs> it was about the ideal reader, and, w- and when you when you think about who that is, is it before the writing project or afterwards? Oh, so 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 I'm working with um, on both ends with 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 Johnny. We we kind of I, I guess it's it's. Uh, let me answer Dave first because it's easy. Our our we only have one genre there, mm-hmm. and it's um it's it's like dark horror sci fi, right? Um, and usually it has one element or another, but it's kind of it's a little Stephen King, Dean R. Koontz ish, okay. like that. That's the genre. And so our ideal reader there is pretty easy to identify. Now with um with, with Johnny, that's much, much, much harder place to be, um, as far as that. Because now it's also easier because we write whatever we want. Um we've done Unicorn Western, we've done the uh, the beam, uh, which is sci-fi, we've done serious sci-fi, we've done kind of like not as serious sci-fi, we've done straight horror and comedy. Um, and then epic fantasy with the Unicorn Western series. So like we're all over the place. We've written for children. We've written for adults. Like, very opposite spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, so our ideal reader has to be people who really like to read and are just really open-minded and like our voice enough to try anything we write. Mm-hmm. And um, now that's not going to be as big a group if we went you know, like hyper niche, like, okay, we're just going to write romance over and over and over because you can do that in mm-hmm. in. There are authors who are just like absurdly successful doing that, but that would bore us a little bit. We like mm-hmm. telling stories, and and for us, we assume our ideal reader is going to give us the benefit of the doubt and let us tell whatever story we want. So, our question isn't who is our ideal reader; it's what genre. How is the best genre to tell this story that we want to tell? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, the answer is with Collective Inkwell. The reader, um, the ideal reader is always part of the process, but it's never really changes. And with, um, the, uh, with, with Roman Sands, they're, they're never a part of the process because they just want a good story. Okay. So, so in, the, in the second case, it's your voice and your way of telling the story that defines the ideal reader. Almost. Yes. It's someone that enjoys your sense of humor, someone that enjoys yes. your storytelling process rather than someone who enjoys X, Y, or Z genre. Yes. Okay. Yes, Got exactly. It. Okay. And I want to talk a little bit about um, something you mentioned in the book, which is, but also something that is kind of always thrown around when we talk about marketing, which is the idea of the first 1,000 fans, yes. which I think is a Seth Godin um, yeah. reference. Um, and this is something that I strongly believe in, and I know that our readers will – want to hear um, a kind of real world example of how an indie writer finds their first 1,000 fans. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how you and Johnny went about getting those first 50, 100, 250, 1,000 fans? Yeah, we, we hit this on a lot of different levels. So um, I can't explain a way. I'll talk about some of the ways. Okay. Um, but we have our podcast, um, you know, which, which uh, I mean, one of the biggest pieces of advice that I would give to a writer trying to market themselves is don't market to other writers. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, now we've broken that twice this year. <laughs> with, with, I mean, with the podcast, we clearly break it every week. And Write, Publish, Repeat <laughs> was written for writers. <laughs> but they're also natural extensions of what we do. And um, the, the, the podcast exists to help writers, yes. But it's also 
um, kind of a public mastermind where the three of us can really talk things out and talk about what's working and what's not. And, and just the, even if we had five listeners, that show in that way would still benefit us. So, um, it's, it's, so there's the podcast. But after the podcast, since we're already going, we have another podcast called Better Off Undead, which is an absolute train wreck <laughs> that, that a lot of people seem to love. And it's, it's, it's random and it's stupid and it's, it's just like juvenile. But um, the people who, who stick around, a lot of them are our readers, you know, and, and really it's, it's, it's an excuse to kind of like punch on Dave a little bit. And um, he gets and, punched on in the book quite yeah, a bit as well. <laughs> yeah. and, and laugh. Like people, mm-hmm. they want to laugh. And, and when someone likes you, they, they want to they, they wanna know you more. They want to you know, read your books and they want to hear you. So that's kind of like a fan service thing. Uh, and beyond that, we put a lot of stuff out there for free. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really important. Uh, that's, that was our focus last year. This year, our focus is a little bit different. Um, we're going to, you know, we have starters for all of our stuff. You know, our, our big goal for 2013 was, was get a lot of premium, uh, free stuff out there so that, you know, people can get to know us. Mm-hmm. Um, this year we're, we're, we're kind of done with Amazon free stuff cause we have it now. We just need to add to those piles. Um, and we're doing a lot of free stuff with blogging, um, and 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 that so far we've only been doing it two weeks, and I'm very very happy with the results. Um, what we're doing is asking big questions that we want to talk about. They're they're things that that we want to talk about in our stories. Um, the natural themes that emerge as we're as we're telling these tales, and uh, it stands to reason that the people who, who again our ideal reader likes our voice specifically. Right, so they're going to be interested in how we think about things, and um, but they're also if we ask the right questions and we and we answer them in the right way, we're going to be broadcasting to a much larger audience. So what Johnny and I have done, and what we'll be following at the Inkwell with later on in this year, is is kind of asking big questions and then answering them. And our first one was, "What defines you?" Which is a great headline. It's very catchy, um, and. It, it basically it just sets the stage for what the site will be about, and 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 it says how do you know who you are? And we make the argument that you we know who we are through our writing, and you know who you are through your reading because you're exploring things. And the beauty of fiction is that you get to explore ideas, mm-hmm. and um, and that first one got like 150 Facebook likes and um, and a lot of traffic, and those people. You know, saw the offer up there at the top of the page to get any book in our catalog if they give us, you know, their name. And so we can, you know, then now they become a reader. And yeah, it cost us five dollars, but not really because like it's not five dollars out of pocket. It's just a download. Like, right. like you're a jerk if you won't give a new reader a download. Like, really? <laughs> and so, um, so the, the next one we did after that is. Um, is revenge ever justified? Which is a great question to ask. And we talk about it and we tell our revenge stories, but we tie it into the revenge thriller that we wrote, Namaste, with a vengeful monk. And, um, and it makes you know, people curious about the story. Downloads go up on the free one because it's no cost to try. Mm-hmm. So it's those kinds of ideas. Um, our, our big franchise is The Beam, and, and the one that we're running tomorrow is What Controls You? Um, and it talks about how in the future we'll be so hyper connected because we already are, and like that's something you want to pass on. And what it does, it, it kind of hits it on two levels. A, the messaging is strong. Um, so our our reader was wondering those same things when they read the beam, mm-hmm. but now it gives them a very easy way to share the world of the beam with somebody in like they didn't have before. The beam is this very complicated idea, um, and somebody, the people who read the beam, seem to like really connect with it, and they want to talk all about it, but like they don't even know where to start. And this is like a conversation starter. Now that you send this blog post, this is kind of what I was talking about, right? So and it makes let, it let me just um, understand how you do this again. So you write the blog post, which is a question essentially, and then you're promoting that on your Facebook page. Yeah, our and, Facebook page, Twitter. It's on the blog. Okay, so um, social media, and then. People are answering this question on the blog post as a comment or as a Facebook oh, comment. Some people do. Some people share it. Some people. Some people tweet it. You okay. know, but um, basically, it just it, it just gets shared. But as new people come to the site to read it and they don't know who we are, 
they say, oh, they're authors. Oh, I could try this book, Namaste, that they're talking about for free. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, it's easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you, you're really, through the blog post, you are expressing yourself and your ideas and the kind of themes and topics that you talk about in your books, but you're essentially doing it through your blog post. Exactly. Okay, yep. got it. Fantastic. Okay. Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about to get those first 1,000 fans? Um, just really connect. Um, all of those things are done to connect. And um, and that's different for everybody. That's one of those things that there is no rule to that. It's like, how do you, everybody connects differently in real life. You know, if you go into a party, five people walk through the door of a party, all of them are approaching that party in a different way. And we get all like hung up. Oh, it's digital. Like, like as if the normal social rules don't apply to a digital space. And of course they do just do what you would naturally do. Um, here's an example. So, uh, that same offer that we're talking about, you know, where you, you basically, you opt into our email list and you get an email that says, Hey, um, thank you. Like, we're really lucky to have a new reader. Um, Go to this link and pick a book anywhere on this page. Tell me what you want, and I'll send it to you for free. And now those emails, some people, like, they they send you a long email. I read this, and I'm just so, like, I'm so thankful. And, and you have to answer every single one of those emails. And I got an email last week that asked me if that was an automated process, you know. And, yeah, I totally want to automate that process because – it's hard. Like it's time consuming. There are days when I'm hours in email and I feel like I can't get out of it. But right now we're still building our thousand true fans. Mm -hmm. And every single person who responds to that offer now, they deserve my attention. Absolutely. Like I want my first thousand true fans to get like everything I can give them because like they were there before it all happened, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm really lucky to have the the fan base that I do already, but I know that's going to continue to grow because mm-hmm. that's what I do for a living. And when it gets to a place where I can't handle all those emails because all of a sudden that's a full-time job, then I will have to automate it. But I don't want to right now because I'm connecting with those people. And people know when something's automated and when it's not. Mm-hmm. Personalize your emails. It takes time, mm-hmm. but it's worth it. And so... There is no like magic key there. It's just think about the ways that you would treat every single person as if they are your true fan. Mm-hmm. And don't be don't be cheap. Um, you know, if someone wants to read your book, like get your stuff out there for free mm-hmm. because it's very easy to promote free. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to get known through conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, you could tweet and Facebook all day long with links to your book, but no one's paying attention to that. Like they just think you're a jerk. They're going to ignore you. They're going to like unfollow you or they're going to block you or pretend like that you're not talking. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't do anything for you. What you need is other people talking about how awesome you are. Mm -hmm. And, and it's easy to talk about how awesome something is if there's no risk in trying it. Um, So get, get stuff out there. It's that, that is, you know, we write, publish, repeat is ridiculously long, 120,000 words, but it really does boil down to those three. Yeah, love it. And I just want another opportunity to show this beautiful 120,000 words um, again, because my next question is actually about um, the details when you're publishing. And this is a huge topic that we really could talk about all day. Um, but what are what stands out to you as being the most important things in terms of um, having a nice cover, having a great title, formatting, price, all these kind of things, like the details when you're producing your book, what stands out to you as being the most important things and what things do you see being done wrong all the time? Oh, that's a, that is a huge question. Yeah. Um, all of those, I would say, on a surface level are... Um, equally important with the exception of cover which is on the top okay um we're very visual um anyway and like (laughs) don't judge a book by its cover is perhaps the dumbest thing ever said (laughs) because it now it's now it's actually a smart thing to say you shouldn't judge a book by its cover but you know what it's it's 
it's given people the false idea that like that's actually something you can aspire to a world where like no one's going to judge a book by a cover and and they do and they always have and they always will mm-hmm. and and you need to know that and especially mm-hmm. in a, in a marketplace like all of them Amazon Kobo Barnes and Noble mm-hmm. you're you're seeing little images of the book they're mm-hmm. very clickable if yours isn't clickable no one will even see your product description so yeah and i think um, i think that's a really important point is that I mean, what what I love to do is to go to the bookstore and see which books jump out at me, and and and, and just kind of like train yourself that way. Yeah. Um. Or or not even do it consciously, but when you do go to pick up a book, think, oh, why did I like? What was it about this book that jumped out at me? Um. But actually, going to the bookstore and browsing is a completely different experience than being online and seeing that tiny thumbnail. Um. And actually, it's funny that um a friend of mine just published her book and. I went to the book launch, and in person, that book cover looks great. But when I had seen it online a few weeks before, I I was kind of disappointed with how it looked. Um, and and I really think that probably because the book was traditionally published, um, the publisher is much more concerned about how that looks in in person, um, not in person, but <laughs> in, in <laughs> book. If that's even an expression. Um, but yeah, so being clickable at a tiny, tiny, tiny size um, and on a screen and in a marketplace where you, it's going to be surrounded by several other tiny covers as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so cover is the most important you have to, thing. Because you have to stand out. Mm-hmm. It's like, um, you know what? You, you got to think of your, your cover like a headline, right? And if you're online... You're not selling the idea of a post in your tweet. If you're, if you're tweeting well... You're selling the click. You, you just you, you need that click, and then the, the next part, the next phase is okay. Now, d- now, don't be a jerk. Deliver on the, your promise. Mm-hmm. Like that's really mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. If you make a promise on Twitter, you better fill it. If you're just being like a guy who wants to get clicks, then like I don't know, you deserve to like down catch on fire or something. Like don't do that. But um, deliver. And your cover has to do the same. Like your cover is, you're you're clicking them to your product description, and that's where you're you're justifying your title. You're speaking to your ideal reader. Um, don't just try to sell the book. That's actually a bad idea. If you promise everything to everyone, you're going to disappoint many, and you can't do that. You you really want to use, um, you know, write, publish, repeat is a is a good example. We want to tell people what it will and will not do. We're not promising that it's easy. Like we're not. There is no formula. There is no like it, it paint by numbers. Like it, like we can't promise that, and we actively don't promise that because we don't want the people who want that to buy the book because they'll think it's long winded and and like promises a lot of hard work, and that's mm-hmm. so not what they wanted. Yeah. They wanted a short book that told them how to do it, mm-hmm. um, and we don't have those answers. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and and actually, I think in the in the book, if I'm if I'm right you actually have a whole section on who this book is for and who this book is not for, right? Yes. So yes. Defining that very early is almost like a filter so that you're not going to get those, you know, terrible readers that are going to leave you horrible reviews. And, and yeah, not- no, we, we got them anyway, but, <laughs> um, but, but they're, they're such a small percentage. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as of this morning, the book has 210 reviews, um, and only four of them are one stars. Almost all of them are five stars, and that's really awesome. Okay. Now, the ones that are um, are one stars call us long winded and like verbose, and <laughs> this book needed to be edited. It's just too too talky, um, and that's what some of our four stars say also. And all of those are totally fair. Like those are really really fair because mm-hmm. it is long winded, it is verbose, it is chatty. But that's who we are. Like that's mm-hmm. how we are on the podcast, and our fans know that and love it. And we got a substantial amount of five stars because of that style. Mm-hmm. So the the one stars are just a cost of doing business. Like right. we four out of two hundred ten. Like I'm so happy with that ratio. Mm-hmm. Like the 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 book has done well, and the response has been incredible, better than we even hoped. And we're lucky for that. But but it's not it's not free. You have to be willing to alienate someone. And the product description is a great place to do that. Um, mm-hmm. You do it with your cover. Um, like you, we've all seen romance covers and erotica covers. Not a lot of variety there, right? Mm-hmm. Like infinite possibilities within those borders. But 
they've all got scantily clad women and or hunky men. Like that's because well, that's, topless men sell yeah, books. Yeah, <laughs> they totally do. And yeah. so you you have to um, you have to kind of lean into that, mm-hmm. you know, and know that's again that's knowing your reader. So you you gear a um, you, you gear your cover toward them. You're not always remember you are not necessarily your reader. Um, don't design a cover that you would like or that you think is awesome. Design one that your ideal reader will like and think is awesome. And you will 100% of the time sell more books. Mm -hmm. Great. Love it. All right. Well, that was a huge topic, but you did a really good job of just (laughs) hitting the highlights. (laughs) Um, One last question for you. And I want to ask you this question because you are in quite a unique situation where you have had great self-publishing success and I believe that led on to your um, you being picked up by Amazon's imprint um, 47 North is that the name of the imprint? that's correct yeah which is the um, mystery imprint yeah it's 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 a sci-fi thriller sci-fi, sorry. sci-fi thriller horror which is essentially what collected inkwell is okay. so okay. It's, it is a perfect fit so you have you've basically had experience on both sides of the coins, uh, both sides of the sides of the coin. Um, and I know that many of our readers at the Right Life magazine are going to be watching this because they're interested in you know creating that sustainable long term indie publishing career, but kind of also would like to explore the options within traditional publishing if they can as well. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the experience you've had? in self-publishing versus the traditional publishing and and how that's been for you yeah i um i've greatly like with an exponent prefer self-publishing to traditional um to, i i traditional just <laughs> like i i just i i'm grateful that we we got the deal like that was that was really really exciting at the time um, and we, what we ended up doing is three books in the, the zombie series Z2134. Um, I'm actually writing the, the final one right now with Dave. Um, and we did one season of a sh- uh, series called Monstrous, and we did not renew for a second season. Okay. Um, uh, I just, I, I think my experience might be different from a lot of people's simply because um, I, I know how to sell books. And I I like that process. I like that part of it. Um, And so I I like having control. I like being able to change a product description, change a call to action, um, include stuff in bundles. Um, All the stuff that I do to push my own stuff, I can't do when it's traditional. So I just have like these two stepchildren um, and it's, it's, it's hard and, um, I'm not as driven to promote that stuff, A, because um, one of the things with Amazon, okay, this is actually really good. So you, you, we talk about knowing your ideal reader, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really, really important. Well, our reviews are good. You know, across the board, our reviews are really great. Johnny and I maintain a 4.9 average, um, and, uh, and, and Dave and I a 4.7. Um, now that gets factored in with a lot of stuff with um, with, with our Amazon deals. Now our Amazon deals, um, they're both both of them were deals of the day. Um, they both went wide. They were like Kindle specials, so they got a lot of traffic. Um, you know, they got a lot, a lot of traffic. But they also fell into the hands of a lot of people who were not the ideal readers. Mm-hmm. So. Because we couldn't control, you know, I mean, in our last little section about all the stuff you have to take care of, one of the most important points was trim your tribe right there, you know, Mm -hmm. eliminate the people who aren't going to like your book from getting it in the first place, Mm -hmm. because you don't want that bad review. Like you want people who are going, who are predisposed to like you Mm -hmm. to consume your, your creativity. Mm -hmm. The people who are not predisposed to like you, you, you don't want them. And and being deal of the day is awesome because you know you 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 get a lot of traffic. A lot of people know your name all of a sudden. But if if it really damages who you are as a creator, then long term that's not good, mm-hmm. and you can't control it. So, for example, if monstrous on our end, you know, went deal of the day, and, and our average there is four stars. Okay, so that's low for us, and. and 
And if, if that if it had gone wide and we ended up with that four stars, then what we would immediately do is send review copies to our readers because they're predisposed to like it and to leave it a good review. Mm -hmm. So anyone who's reviewed our stuff before we would send them review copies, we can't send review copies because it doesn't belong to us. And so, you know, now you just, you, you look through our list and scroll past and, you know, good review, good review, good review. Oh, that one's only four stars. That's the Amazon one. And there's, I can't, I can't, I can't really include it in the family, and that makes it hard. So um, I guess I'm just too much of uh, an indie guy. You know, I have a catalog, and I want my, I want everything I do to kind of come under the same catalog. Mm -hmm. So, um, but for a lot of creatives, like they, they, they want to just write the book, and they want to just write the book and have somebody else do all of that. Um, you know, that's awesome. Like, you, they should. Yeah, and I, I, I think that. Um just from authors that I've known that have tr published traditionally, they, that's the reason that they published traditionally is because they wanted someone else to do all the hard work and they yeah. wanted someone else to do the selling. But more and more, it's becoming the case that they are still having to do the hard oh, work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no doubt about it. We, we had to market. We had to market. And um, the reason I went with Amazon is because because I appreciate what they've done for the writing community. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they changed my life. Um, you know, my sales aren't coming from like, a little bit from Kobo, but n not anything compared to Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, same with Barnes and Noble. Like it's 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 pepper on the meal, mm -hmm. you know, and it's important that um, like I, I appreciated Amazon. So I wasn't interested in a traditional deal, but I was interested in working with Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, I, I feel like I got some of the, the kind of the downsides of publishing, like the lack of control and all of that. But I didn't really get as many of the benefits as I was hoping for. So um, I, I, I'm not disillusioned on it, really, um, because it was kind of what I expected. I had just hoped for more. Mm -hmm. um, but... It it did tell me what, like it's the kind of thing I had to do. I had to know if it was right for me. I Absolutely. because I couldn't have an opinion until I did it. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad I did it. Um, I might do it again this year. Um, I, I have a project actually that I was going um, to do with Johnny right at the beginning of this year, and we were going to pitch it to a um, a major publisher as like it was specifically going to be for that. But um, the project got bigger in my head. And traditional, and this is another thing with traditional publishing, like they have to print it. They know exactly what they want. And the idea in my head that I, I the story I want to tell with Johnny is too big for traditional publishing. It would need to be at least 150,000 words. Mm -hmm. And that's if we're like keeping it tight, like our ideas kind of unspool. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to like shove something in and so, so our agent said, well, you can make it a trilogy. And, yeah, but it's not a trilogy. Like, it's one really big idea that needs to be about this big. Right. <laughs> like, like, that's okay. Yeah. And, and, and so we had to take it off. And, and, and we're not just writing that just to write it. Like, we were going to write that project to be a traditional publishing. And we're not just going to write something so that it can go to traditional publishing. So it just got shelved. And it's like I'm not for or against traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. I think it's like anything else. You decide when is it right, you know, mm -hmm. and, and right now traditional publishing isn't right, mm -hmm. but it probably will be again at some point. Right, depending on the project and the, and the time in your yeah. career. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing your experiences. And um, that was full of juicy stuff for us and definitely <laughs> um, learned a lot about writing and publishing both from your book and from the interview um thank you very so, much thank you sean my pleasure bye 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 <laughs>